14. La Vie en Rose. The entrance to the Roi Galant was a seven-foot golden picture frame, which had once, perhaps, enclosed the vast portrait of a noble European. It was in a discreet corner of the kitchen, the public roulette and boule room, where several tables were still busy. As Bond took Vesper's arm and led her over the gilded step, he fought back a hankering to borrow some money from the case and plaster maximums over the nearest table. But he knew that this would be a brash and cheap gesture pour éparter la bourgeoisie. Whether he won or lost, it would be a kick in the teeth to the luck which had been given him. The nightclub was small and dark, lit only by candles and gilded candelabra, whose warm light was repeated in wall mirrors set in more golden picture frames. The walls were covered in dark red satin and the chairs and banquette in matching red plush. In the far corner, a trio, consisting of a piano, an electric guitar, and drums, were playing La Vie en Rose with muted sweetness. Seduction dripped on the quietly throbbing air. It seems to Bond that every couple must be touching with passion under the tables. They were given a corner table near the door. Bond ordered a bottle of Veuve Clignot and scrambled eggs and bacon. They sat for a time listening to the music, and then Bond turned to Vesper. It's wonderful sitting here with you and knowing the job's finished. It's a lovely end to the day. The prize giving. He expected her to smile. She said, yes, isn't it? in a rather brittle voice. She seemed to be listening carefully to the music. One elbow rested on the table and her hand supported her chin, but on the back of her hand and not on the palm, and Bond noticed that her knuckles showed white as if her fist was tightly clenched. Between the thumb and first two fingers of her right hand, she held one of Bond's cigarettes as an artist holds a crayon, and though she smoked with composure, she tapped the cigarette occasionally into an ashtray when the cigarette had no ash. Bond noticed these small things because he felt intensely aware of her and because he wanted to draw her into his own feeling of warmth and relaxed sensuality but he accepted her reserve. He thought it came from a desire to protect herself from him, or else it was her reaction to his coolness to her earlier in the evening, his deliberate coolness, which he knew had been taken as a rebuff. He was patient. He drank champagne and talked a little about the happenings of the day and about the personalities of Matisse and Leiter and about the possible consequences for Le Chiffre. He was discreet, and he only talked about the aspects of the case on which she must have been briefed in London. She answered perfunctorily. She said that, of course, they had picked out the two gunmen, but had thought nothing of it when the man with the stick had gone to stand behind Bond's chair. They could not believe that anything would be attempted in the casino itself. Directly Bond and Leiter had left to walk over to the hotel, she had telephoned Paris and told M's representative of the result of the game. She had had to speak guardedly, and the agent had rung off without comment. She had been told to do this whatever the result. M had asked for the information to be passed on to him personally at any time of the day or night. This was all she said. She sipped at her champagne and rarely glanced at Bond. She didn't smile. Bond felt frustrated. He drank a lot of champagne and ordered another bottle. The scrambled eggs came and they ate in silence. At four o'clock, Bond was about to call for the bill when the maitre d'hôtel appeared at their table and inquired for Miss Lynde. He handed her a note which she took and read hastily. Oh, it's only Matisse, she said. He says, would I come to the entrance hall? He's got a message for you. Perhaps he's not in evening clothes or something. I won't be a minute. Then perhaps we could go home. She gave him a strange smile. I'm afraid I don't feel very good company this evening. It's been rather a nerve-wracking day. I'm so sorry. Bond made a perfunctory reply and rose, pushing back the table. I'll get the bill, he said, and watched her take the first few steps to the entrance. He sat down and lit a cigarette. He felt flat. He suddenly realized that he was tired. The stuffiness of the room hit him as it had hit him in the casino earlier in the previous day. He called for the bill and took a last mouthful of champagne. It tasted bitter, as the first glass too many always does. He would have liked to see Matisse's cheerful face and heard his news, perhaps even a word of congratulation. Suddenly, the note to Vesper seemed odd to him. It was not the way Matisse would do things. He would have asked them both to join him at the bar of the casino, or he would have joined them in the nightclub, whatever his clothes. They would have laughed together and the Matisse would have been excited. He had much to tell Bond, more than Bond had to tell him. The arrest of the Bulgarian, who had probably talked some more? The chase after the man with the stick? The chief's movements when he had left the casino. Bond shook himself. He hastily paid the bill, not waiting for the change. He pushed back his table and walked quickly through the entrance without acknowledging the good nights of the maitre d'hôtel or the doorman. He hurried through the gaming room and looked carefully up and down the long entrance hall. He cursed and quickened his step. There were only one or two officials and two or three men and women in the evening clothes getting their things at the vestiaire. No Vesper. No Matisse. He was almost running. He got to the entrance and looked along the steps to the left and right, down and among the few remaining cars. The commissioner came towards him. A taxi, monsieur? Bond waved him aside and started down the steps, his eyes staring into the shadows, the night air cold on his sweating temples. He was halfway down when he heard a faint cry, then the slam of a door way to the right. With a harsh growl and a stutter from the exhaust, a beetle-brown Citroën shot out of the shadows into the light of the moon, its front-wheel drive dry-skidding through the loose pebbles of the forecourt. 
its tail rocked on its soft springs as if a violent struggle was taking place on the back seat. With a snarl, it raced out to the wide entrance gate in a spray of gravel. A small black object shot out of the open rear window and thudded into a flower bed. There was a scream of tortured rubber as the tires caught the boulevard in a harsh left-handed turn, the deafening echo of a Citroën's exhaust in second gear, a crash into top, then a swiftly diminishing crackle as the car haired between the shops on Main Street towards the coast road. Bond knew he would find Vesper's evening bag among the flowers. He ran back with it across the gravel to the brightly lit steps and scrabbled through its contents while the commissioner hovered round him. The crumpled note was there amongst the usual feminine baggage. Can you come out to the entrance hall for a moment? I have news for your companion. René Matisse.